May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each heart be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Good morning. I'm not going to spend much time on, on this this morning, but I do want to express my admiration for the way you have responded to your crisis in the last two weeks, your pastoral care and support of one another, your maturity, and as always, your leadership. The lay and ordained leadership at St. Andrews is outstanding. It stands out, and it has for a long time. Along with you, I'm grateful also <clears throat> for the response that we have received from around the church throughout the nation, including our diocese, as well as your friends within the city of Amarillo. I can feel the, prayer, the prayers and the support, I suspect you can too. I'm very proud of the Episcopal Church as I am proud to serve you. In the meantime, last evening we celebrated the sacrament of baptism using the holy horse trough. <laughs> and we gathered for the low country boil and kids played in the yard, adults played in the yard, footballs were flying around, volleyballs, soccer balls, and I mean, there really is a great community here and uh, so much joy, so much joy here. And this morning we celebrate the Sacrament of Confirmation as 20 some odd, I'm not sure I remember how many, are being confirmed. And to those of you being confirmed or received into this tradition today, those of you reaffirming your faith, uh, we want you to know it is a privilege to be a part of your lives on this day and on your journey. And later during this service, everyone here will make a vow that we will do all in our power to support you in your life in Christ. So all baptized people are called by God to embody and proclaim God's love as made known in the birth, life, teaching, suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus. In Jesus, in all of his life, in all that he teaches, in all that he does, we see unmerited grace, undeserved forgiveness, and unconditional love. That's the gospel. Today's gospel. Jesus and his disciples are in the upper room, and having completed the Last Supper and the foot washing, Judas has left the room on his mission to betray Jesus. After a long farewell visit with his disciples and before Jesus is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, knowing that his time has come, Jesus lifts up his eyes to heaven and prays to the Father. On the night before he is to die, Jesus prays to the Father, first for himself, then for his disciples, and finally for those who will come to believe through his disciples. And in this intimate prayer to the Father, we get the picture of what Jesus thinks of his followers. Jesus says to the Father, I have made your name known to those whom you gave me. I'm asking on behalf of those whom you gave me. Before it's over three times, Jesus refers to his followers as the ones given to him. Jesus sees us as a gift. The one who up to that point lived with us and taught us and was about to suffer and be crucified for us, saw it all as gift. And I would suggest not just in the sense that this unique calling itself was a gift to him, as he does talk about the work given to him, 
not only in the sense that it all gave his life purpose and meaning, meaning, which perhaps it did. I'm suggesting that Jesus sees his followers and sees us as a gift, not as a hassle, not as an inconvenience, not as a burden, not even as another soul to save, to give his life purpose or a reason for living. To Jesus, we are a gift, each one of us, period. Now that might sound kind of startling in everyday life when we are not so agreeable or compatible or when we make a costly mistake or when we cause a little trouble and someone has to bail us out. We don't tend to think of ourselves as a gift. We're pretty sure that we are a hassle or a problem or a burden. On our behalf, someone else had to make a sacrifice or go out of their way or forgive us, which isn't easy. So we might feel like we owe them in return for their act of kindness or their sacrificial act of mercy. We don't feel like we are a gift in those circumstances. At a minimum, I suspect we have an impulse to pay them back, which would make it a transaction, not a gift. And on the other hand, I wonder if we Christians, who are, actually are often good and helpful and give sacrificially of our time and our money and often do improve the world around us and often do make life better for others and often do lift the burden of others, I wonder, I wonder if deep down inside we might have expectations of our own maybe a little reward from God for our sacrificial offering. But of course, that would be like trying to earn a free gift. I'm mindful of a story of a particular sacrificial death. Perhaps you saw the movie Saving Private Ryan. Now, I find it hard to believe that Saving Private Ryan is 25 years old and probably nobody here under 40 saw it when it was released. I find it hard to believe how old I am. But in true baby boomer fashion, and I had to get that in for the rector, in true baby boomer fashion, I'm going to use this story to make a point anyway. Saving Private Ryan is based on a true story from World War II, a team of soldiers, is sent into the battlefield to save a soldier named Private Ryan. As the story goes, all of Private Ryan's brothers had been killed previously in battle. So the United States tried to save one last son for his parents' sake. At any rate, the character played by Tom Hanks gives his life saving Private Ryan. It is the ultimate sacrifice. In his dying breath, the Tom Hanks character grabs Private Ryan by his lapels and says, earn this, earn this. That we understand. He's saying, don't let this sacrifice go to waste. That we understand. On the night before he dies, and on the next day from the cross itself, Jesus never says that, never says earn anything. His sacrifice is an incomprehensible gift. It's a saving gift. There's nothing we can do to earn it. There is nothing we can do ever to increase or decrease God's love for us. We're not a gift to Jesus because we gave him a mission to accomplish or give his life, gave his life purpose or, me, or meaning. And we're not a gift because we've earned the status of gift through our sacrificial offerings. He sees us as a gift, period. On this night before he dies, in his prayer to the Father, when what matters in life is in true perspective, and what's really important in the world takes top priority as it would for anyone. 
Jesus prays for those given to him. He prays that we will be one, even as Jesus and the Father are one. And I wonder if that's true. I wonder if it's true that any one of us here today might have a similar prayer on our last night. Wouldn't we pray for unity? That everyone we know and love would show mercy and forgive one another and be reconciled? And as life as we know it is coming to a close, wouldn't we see it as a gift? And wouldn't we want to see one another with all our differences as a gift? In the grand scheme of things, isn't it all gift? In Jesus' prayer to the Father, we hear God's purpose in the incarnation, the reason the Word became flesh. Jesus prays that we will be at one with him and one another. That's what is meant by the theological word atonement. It breaks down into at one -ment. Jesus prays that we will be at one with one another on earth as we will be at the heavenly banquet at one with all the angels and archangels and all the company of heaven. This morning's banquet, the Holy Eucharist, also known as the Great Thanksgiving Eucharist, the Greek word meaning Thanksgiving. This celebration of the Holy Eucharist is a foretaste of that heavenly banquet, a gift freely given out of love in this great Thanksgiving. We give thanks to God for the gift of life the gift of one another, and the gift of his Son, who makes all things one. In the name of the Holy Trinity, one God in whom we live and move and have our being.